Before the webinar begins, rename your Zoom name to your complete name and department and or affiliation so that we can easily identify you. Kindly mute your microphone when not in use. Next, switch on your video if your connectivity allows you. If you have questions with regards to the presentation, there will be an open forum right after. Please type it in the chat box where you Use the raise hand reaction button in Zoom and unmute yourself. The session is video recorded. Recordings will be made available at the Silliman Online University Learning website.
let's put ourselves in the presence of the Lord. Heavenly Father, we come to you in this hour asking for your guidance and protection to our virtual gathering today. We thank you for the gift of life, the gift of family, the gift of work, and the gift of friendship. We thank you for this great opportunity to bring us together in this session as brothers and sisters. Bless the community, the facilitator, and the attendees of this gathering. May we continue to value and appreciate the true essence and meaning of life with the help of your grace. And as we go along our discussion today, we humbly pray that you would deepen our understanding. Lord, enlighten us and give us wisdom every day. Forgive us for our shortcomings and remind us to always be mindful of the things we do in life. We offer our life and our decisions to you, O Lord. May this gathering today create a memorable experience and a fruitful outcome. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, our Redeemer and our Savior. Amen. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Silima University, Dr. Mariano Lau, Free Computer Education Program. By the way, I am your moderator for this afternoon. I am Grace L. Apau, and I would like to welcome everyone for today's webinar on a topic, Understanding Computer Viruses. Today, we will be learning the different types and strategies to keep your computers safe from viruses. And allow me to introduce our resource speaker for this afternoon. Our resource speaker for this afternoon is a faculty member of College of Business Administration, Silimar University, and currently a program coordinator of the Business Analytics Program of the College of Business Administration. He was also a member of IT-related organizations such as ISA Hamanila Chapter and Internet Society Philippines and work as a volunteer for the Philippine College of Physicians Nagras Oriental Chapter as a technical staff. Prior to his faculty status in the university, he worked as an ID auditor of the inter university while finishing his MBA degree. Upon completion of his degree, he joined the college as a faculty and eventually became a chairperson of the Business Computer Applications Department of CBA. He also handles software development consultancy for small and medium enterprises locally. So ladies and gentlemen, let's all welcome our resource speaker for this afternoon. He is no other than Assistant Professor Larry Vincent Rehensha. Let's give him a virtual round of applause. All right, thank you for that, Grace. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So thank you for spending your afternoon with me today. So hopefully you can learn some something new or something additional learnings uh, for you today. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, yeah. sir. Yes, sir. All right, that's perfect. So yes, uh, I believe many of us are very familiar with uh, computer viruses. So for today, I'll be discussing uh, Okay, first of all, uh, you might be wondering, uh, am I the best person <laughs> to discuss uh, understanding computer viruses? Uh, well, at some point, uh, I did learn uh, a little bit on cybersecurity, and I have also some uh, international consultancy for a cybersecurity firm in uh, Sydney, Australia called Jump Cyber. So it's actually a uh, uh, manage uh, cybersecurity services. And what I will share to you today is also part on those things that uh, they have provided to their clients. Although I was not part of the operation side, 
uh, but uh, in terms of provisioning their employees, in terms of what those things that they need to prepare before an employee joins a company, uh, there are several steps that they have to do first. So I can share to you that one later. But before before that, uh, I'll discuss first uh, uh, what computer viruses are. So I'll tackle the following. So computer viruses, uh, what is it? Uh, how computer viruses has evolved, have evolved over time? and uh, getting infected and avoiding them or protecting ourselves from them. And then I'll discuss uh, more, a little bit on cybersecurity threats because this is still what is more popular or more common rather uh, today. So talking about computer virus, uh, we have been talking about viruses every day, right? Since uh, late 2019 up to now because of the pandemic. Uh, but the virus that we'll be talking about today will be something that doesn't lead us to a hospital. Uh, but instead, your device will probably be brought for repair to, to a repair shop. So viruses have been around since early 1980s, if you, or even 70s, in fact, uh, but not necessarily as we know them today, because today are, are quite rogue. As four computers have become more uh, protect, uh, protected, viruses have also learned to adapt. So this makes them not only harder to detect, it is also sometimes more harmful. So much like uh, a flu virus, a computer virus is also designed to spread. So from host to host, and it has the ability to replicate itself. So by definition here, by Norton, uh, a, a computer virus is a malicious piece of software or, or malware that once inside your computer replicates and infects the other computers in your network, stealing passwords or data, logging keystrokes, corrupting files, spamming, uh, spamming your contacts, or even taking over your machine. So this particular, uh, or in technical terms rather, uh, a computer virus is uh, basically a program written to alter the way computers operate. And it is designed to spread from one computer to another. So the virus operates by inserting itself or attaching itself from a, a legitimate program or probably a document that supports uh, uh, probably macros in order to execute its code on the host machine. So in the process, the virus has the potential to cause unexpected or damaging effects. Uh, such as harming the system software or by corrupting or destroying your data. And over time, if you notice, if you visit or have you tried uh, looking computer viruses online, and if you look at uh, Wikipedia, uh, although I do not have to discuss all of this because there's so many of them. So uh, when you type, uh, timeline of computer viruses. Uh, the very first program that was created was actually in 1971. It's called the Creeper system. So this was an experimental self-replicating program, which was written by Bob Thomas. Uh, and it was a way to test the John Newman uh, theory. So in terms of how John Newman architecture of our computers, so it was a way of, uh, you know, just just to test, to see how it works. And it was actually quite successful. And in fact, from, from that time moving um, forward until today, uh, any new variant of the virus is actually somewhat, or more or less, it was based from its predecessor. So if you're going to look at the timeline, there's actually a lot of them. I'm, I'm just uh, taking note some of the popular ones here. So Alk Cloner, that's also one of the uh, popular uh, viruses. Uh, another one is the, in 1988 uh, by Morris uh, Internet Worm. So can you imagine this is actually, uh, he created a, a virus wherein during that time, I think uh, it says there uh, the internet, uh, brought large pieces of the internet to stand to a standstill on November 2nd, 1988. And just imagine by that time, 
I'm not sure if how connected the Philippines by that during that time. I, I I'm not sure, but just imagine uh, during that time he was able ready to infect uh, several computers using that diskette inside uh, that uh, glass. Another one uh, is actually uh, Michelangelo and. If you remember the I love you virus, we also have that, the Melissa. There's, there's actually a lot. Uh, I'll show a few uh, in my next slide, but what do you think is the key, uh, should I say, the key reason or why do you think they have evolved over time? What do you think the virus, why do you think the virus has evolved over time? So, there's probably uh, a lot of people who want to experiment, okay? And who wants to see for themselves. But for me, one of the reasons I believe is uh, because of vulnerability. Our computers are actually designed, uh, they're probably not designed to perform 100%, uh, right? Because as we say, there is no perfect system in this world. And with that alone, a lot of people would really take advantage of creating something that would exploit something. And this is how viruses has evolved. So from creeper system to today's ransomware, can you just imagine this approximately more than 30 years ago, 40 years, and then uh, every year there are just new threats coming out, adapting, recreating themselves as uh, a variant of something, and eventually uh, causing a lot of damage uh, nowadays to not only to individuals, but also to uh, a lot of companies. So the, uh, also, uh, I'm sharing here to you some of the most expensive vulnerabilities of all time. Although if you search for something like this, uh, there's actually a lot of articles of varying degrees in terms of how uh, they identified the most expensive, the most destructive, uh, probably the terminology may be a little bit different, but this one, uh, I got this from WebFX. Uh, they actually have a lot of resource material for this one as a reference, and this is what I uh, have decided to present. So these are just top five of the most uh, expensive vulnerabilities uh, of all time. Uh, this one is the fifth. Uh, 2003 called SQL uh, Slammer. It was actually a worm targeting machines, uh, specifically uh, database servers who are running Microsoft SQL Server. So it actually eliminated phone and internet service for uh, 27 million in South Korea. So 1 billion, more than 1 billion in damages. According to the report, uh, Microsoft has already created a patch for this particular worm. Unfortunately, you know, performing the updates uh, was not immediately done. So this was, as they have said, around six months prior to this incident happened, Microsoft already has a patch for this one. But there are just a lot of servers running that were not updated during that time. The next one is the config configure worm infected up to 15 million computers worldwide downloaded and installed malware on uh, infected uh, pcs until patches uh, marvel gave hackers remote access to infected uh, systems there was around 9 billion uh, more than 9 billion in damages another one is uh, I would I would not say I am proud to say this one, but at some point I was so proud actually, because this was created by a fellow uh, Filipino. So the I love you virus uh, initially spread through emails with the subject line I love you. So more than three million users opened the attachment that activated the virus. So it was only uh, some computers only see uh, that attachments as a text file. Unfortunately, there was an extension that uh, BVS, the Visual Basic Script, which was actually a macro that actually caused a lot of issues, uh, including the US government. So it shut down email servers uh, worldwide. So the estimated damages for that was actually 15 billion. 
And luckily, the programmers were not. Actually, they were just released uh, because during that time, we did not have laws uh, specific to, uh, to, this kind of, so, to this kind of incidents. The next one is uh, the Sasser worm in 2008. So it crashed millions of computers worldwide, brought uh, down Delta Airlines, causing the cancellation of several flights, resulted in 3,000 railway passengers being stranded in Australia. So this one is also quite, uh, uh, what do you call this, uh, destructive, uh, having uh, caused around 18 billion of damages. Another one is, uh, or this is actually the first. So in 2004, uh, my doom worm, uh, the world's fastest uh, spreading uh, computer uh, vulnerability. The goal of the worm was to perform DDoS attacks on SEO.com, uh, showed internet access globally, or slow down rather, uh, internet access globally by approximately 10%. So the estimated damage for this one was around uh, 38 billion. So these uh, viruses are actually, uh, there are different, these are actually uh, variants of some previous predecessors, or they were actually created for the purpose probably of uh, what? Uh, exposing some vulnerabilities, or there are those people also who just uh, do it probably for fun. So nowadays, if you can imagine, if you can compare it, it's there's a little bit of um, uh, a difference in terms of how the viruses have uh, evolved. So in short, if you are going to compare before, the viruses just infect right away and damaging computers. Today, it's a little bit uh, specific and targeted. So in a form of one of those would be malware, I mean, ransomware rather. So I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you also about that one later on. So those are the most expensive vulnerabilities of all time. Of course, there are other viruses that are way, way more complex, uh, such as the one who attacked the nuclear plant in Iran. Uh, that is also quite promising, uh, Stuxnet, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, and there are others also uh, who may not have caused a lot of or that the damage is not that big, but the headache, the problems that they have given to uh, individual people and companies are, are, are causing uh, so much time uh, uh, wasted. The next one I'm, uh, I'm sharing here is actually the different types of computer viruses. Uh, I'm not sure if I am able to cover this one, but uh, this one, I have adapted this particular slide from VPN Overview. So they have actually uh, uh, listed down already the different uh, types of computer viruses. The boot sector, uh, this particular computer virus uh, infects a computer's uh, master boot record. So this particular, uh, if I, I remember, this one is really a, a pain. Uh, this virus is a pain because the moment that it hits your computer, it requires your hard drive uh, to be reformatted. And that's one thing that I really hate about this one. If I'm not mistaken, I was infected by this uh, particular uh, virus once. The second is the overwrite uh, virus. So this particular computer virus infects your files and destroys them. So the only way to remove it is to delete all infected files, resorting, resulting in the loss of data uh, containing, uh, containing them. So override viruses most commonly spread uh, through emails. We have also what we call the resident virus. So this kind of virus uh, embed itself in the computer's memory. So if the original virus is deleted, a copy, of, uh, a copy of it can remain in the infected computer's memory. It can be activated when your operating system performs certain functions. Since these viruses hard, uh, I mean, hide in your uh, RAM, they often go undetected by antivirus software. So this one is actually quite uh, interesting because the way it is positioning itself is that uh, it's in the memory. 
So basically, <clears throat> antivirus do not go that as far back then. But eventually, uh, there were fixes on this one, and they were able to uh, capture or detect this kind of viruses. Then we have also the file infecting virus. So this computer virus, uh, it inserts infected code into, uh, into executable files. So remember, uh, most files, especially the, the ones in Windows that is .exe file, when this file is infected, and the program is, uh, or when the when the infected file, uh, when the infected program rather is open, uh, the virus overwrites or destroys it. Okay, so this can also this particular virus can also spread uh, to a computer's operating sy system, and even uh, reformat them. This one is still common today, uh, the macro virus. So. This is written in the same language software like uh, Microsoft Office uh, under the macro. So Microsoft actually has uh, the BB script embedded in uh, Microsoft Office. And this is popularly uh, run in Excel and Microsoft Word. So uh, they embed malicious code in these documents, which begin to run uh, when the files are open. So the virus may infect all of the user's documents, altering them or making them uh, unreadable. Uh, I'm pretty sure you might have experienced that in the past. So this kind of virus still exists today and still are quite popular actually. So normally they can be shared easily, especially if you're sharing that particular do document through a USB drive or even in a network. Another one is the web scripting virus. This virus uh, hides the code uh, on web pages or web browsers. So when you access a particular page where the code contains as virus, it can lead to your device being infected as well. Okay, just one second. All right, so Yes, uh, next one is the polymorphic virus. So this polymorphic virus acquires a different form each time the file, uh, the infected file or the program is executed. So this, these are actually quite, uh, what do you call this? They actually have uh, adopted uh, the polymorphism capability of the object-oriented programming. So this particular mechanism of the virus uh, actually helps them evade uh, detection. And then, but eventually uh, <clears throat> uh, antivirus companies were able to find a solution in terms of detecting these particular uh, viruses. Uh, Multipartite uh, multi virus. This can be uh, thought as a combination of different types as described here. It attacks using different vectors and affects different computer parts such as operating system, files, and programs. So uh, these different uh, types of viruses can actually be combined. So probably uh, the way it's going to be deployed, so it could be through the web, and then, but the way he executes itself could be like a polymorphic virus, something like that. So. This kind of virus are actually quite uh, powerful. So moving on, uh, before I move forward to the next, let me clear this up first. Probably some of you might be confused. What is malware and what is a virus? Okay, so back in the day, I think the malware uh, was that, if I'm not mistaken, it was not yet coined or it was not that popular. Uh, but we all know that that is actually a malicious software, right? So uh, I think uh, when I was searching for this one, one of the things I, just, uh, I noticed is that there are different, uh, most of the results are actually coming from different antivirus companies, of course, because they are also promoting the product itself. But uh, I think Avast has given me a more concrete definition of this one that is more understandable. So. Yeah, so when we talk about malware, try to imagine this like 
an umbrella term, okay? So this could be an umbrella term for any malicious software written specifically to infect or harm uh, the host or the user. While a computer virus is just one type of malware. So meaning to say a virus is part of your uh, malware. So the malware basically covers all that is probably happening or all those cybersecurity risks that we have today. So, but uh, all viruses are malware, but not all malware is a virus. Did you get that? Not all, vir uh, all viruses are malware, but not all malware is a virus. So if you're going to look at the types of malware presented here by Tech Target, uh, the virus here is just one of them. And we have adware. I'm not sure you're familiar with adware. Uh, those that are uh, those ads that actually steal your personal information. Rootkits, spyware, uh, ransomware, Trojan horses, uh, remote access, uh, worms, and keyloggers. So these are actually the different types of malwares that we can actually encounter uh, even today, okay? So today there's just a bunch of uh, several types of this one. And luckily uh, we have our initial protection, right? So I hope you do have some protection for against these things. Now, why do we get infected? Why are we vulnerable from getting in, uh, infected with viruses? So uh, I think a good answer to this is something related also to our daily lives. So what we are doing on a daily basis, uh, being exposed outside to other people, and basically what we do exposes us to viruses or diseases. And for us, our first defense is pretty much our immune system. The stronger our immune system, the lesser chance of infection. Of course, nowadays, because of COVID, our first line of defense is probably the mask. But in a regular or the, during the pre-pandemic, I think uh, we all know that uh, when we are weak, we easily got infected, right? Although in computers, uh, it might be a little bit different, but there's actually some form of similarity. So when we get onto our computers, uh, what do we do? We do check our emails, right? We do instant messaging. So uh, we do instant messaging, we file, uh, we share files, we upload and so on. So these are actually the things wherein the virus is actually, uh, or these activities rather that we do in our computer are something that are being used as a medium also by these viruses to, to spread or transfer. So the applications that we're using is actually a possible, uh, a possible avenue for him to transfer to your machine. So in a way, we cannot eliminate these things. We can probably minimize or reduce our chances of getting infected uh, by protecting ourselves. So uh, in here, uh, spam emails and attachments. So most of the time security analysts would say that uh, they, they found around 75 to 94% of all malwares are actually delivered by email. And I believe that is true because more often than not, uh, if we find some interesting email, we tend to open it without realizing it's already something uh, that we have downloaded because a mere click can also lead already to a drive or uh, a drive-by download or install of a particular software underneath without us being noticing it. Another one is instant messaging. We do a lot of instant messaging nowadays, especially that we are on remote. We do Zoom, you know, Microsoft Teams, Messenger. This is also a way of spreading viruses. So uh, especially when someone sends you an infected link in a chat message, and then the tendency for you clicks on it, 
So because uh, the one who sent it is a friend of yours, so you tend also to click on that link and then eventually it actually leads your computer or probably your device to get corrupted. File sharing is also very common. So file sharing is uh, probably uh, a very popular way of, you know, getting your viruses spread throughout the network. So if a user uploads an infected file, this could be to the cloud or the network or comp uh, the company network. And the chances are that particular virus will be spread to anyone else who will access to that account. Okay. So although Google, for example, and even uh, OneDrive, they have actually some scanning or they have already built in scanning mechanism for files that are actually small. But the bigger ones, uh, I believe you'll be notified that there is no scan because the file is too big and download at your own risk. Another popular among us is also downloading illegal software. So downloading is really uh, ones that lead us to, uh, what do you call this? Uh, this is like a betrayal for me. Uh, we tend to enjoy a lot of free programs by downloading them illegally, but in the end, we are actually at the losing end of this situation because every time we download uh, illegal software, the chances are, especially those crackers who uh, made the software available for you for free, uh, is that they actually tend, or they will always, 90% uh, of the time, they will always drop some kind of malware to your machine in order for your machine to steal data. And more recently, a more capable one is to utilize the computing power of your machine for uh, crypto mining, Bitcoin mining. So that is where uh, it hurts really. So uh, hopefully some of you, uh, would look into, you know, avoiding to download illegal software, or it may not be an illegal software, but uh, you're just looking for a way that you can obtain it for free. And yeah, it's it's really costly actually, you know, if you you spend money for for this particular software. But try to try to look for alternatives first. There there are actually available or alternatives for for this software. And mind you, uh, most IT professionals would say that 70% of the time, 70% uh, of the time, uh, those unauthorized programs that were downloaded uh, is lead actually to uh, more than half of the incidents relating to data loss are the ones causing it. So it's something that, uh, what do you call this? Sorry, one more second. Okay, <clears throat> yes. Uh, a lot of these uh, programs can really cause uh, a lot of problems, not only on a personal level, but also on a company level. Uh, I think, yes, uh, critical software updates. Uh, this particular uh, updates is actually very important, especially nowadays that we now have Windows 11 and some of you might still be using, I hope not Windows XP, uh, at least probably Windows 10 by now uh, because Windows 7 is no longer supported. So uh, Windows 10 or Windows 11, uh, always make sure that you have critical software updates installed. Another one is, uh, infected hardware. This is actually probably very common among us. So USB drives and other removable drives or storage devices can contain viruses and spread them to your computer. Now, this is this is probably not as common nowadays uh, than before. Uh, nowadays, we normally have cloud because most of us are working remotely. So we don't use USB drives, but uh, bad actors always take advantage of having USB drives riddled with viruses, okay? So just pretending that uh, this is actually empty, but then unfortunately, 
uh, it actually contains uh, a lot of uh, viruses. Another one is it may not be something that would, well, some of you might debate this one, but <laughs> uh, this not having an antivirus software, okay? Uh, Mac users would actually debate on this one probably because uh, Mac users believe that they don't need antivirus software. Of course, uh, uh, Apple promised them that, that uh, there are less uh, viruses in Mac compared to Windows machines. And that's probably true because, uh, of course, not everyone can afford Mac computers. So uh, Windows are much more affordable. So more people are actually buying Windows machines. But for Windows, uh, the built-in antivirus software, uh, the Windows Defender, uh, for most security analysts, they would say that it is not sufficient. It is not sufficient to detect or protect you from viruses or cybersecurity threats. So at some point, you have to invest something. So you have to uh, install an antivirus software. Okay, so uh, you must consider investing. I know some of you might not, you might, might be hesitant because uh, the cost and so on, but I'll show you something later, uh, which you might probably rethink of not of probably spending a little bit. Another one is turning off security, uh, crucial security features. So this particular uh, scenario, there are already security features that are installed by uh, the OS itself in order for you to be protected. You can keep those on, uh, both uh, Mac users and Windows. Although for Mac, uh, much of you don't actually have much freedom on Mac in terms of security. So you'll just have to leave uh, everything to, to Apple. Okay, so I there are other ways probably that you might get infected and spreading it or not necessarily in terms of uh, viruses, but in terms of other security risks, which I will share also later. So how will you know you got infected? So before we go in and protecting ourselves, let's first to know uh, how would we know if we're infected by such. So just like in real life, when we get infected with COVID-19, for example, uh, you will eventually have some form of symptoms, right? Except for asymptomatic. I, that's, that's where the computer and humans would differ. I'm not sure if I have seen a symptomatic computer. Uh, got infected by the virus, but then everything's still the same. Uh, in here, uh, one of the things that you will notice is that slow performance. So a slowdown in computers uh, processing speed is usually uh, a dead giveaway for computer viruses. So the malicious code underneath typically hijacks uh, computing power. So I think you would notice that one. Another one is uh, your computer freezes. So device crashes and freezes up. So in this case, system freezes and crashes are often signs of malware infection in general. Okay. Uh, although there might be also a case of some hardware failure, but uh, at some point, uh, viruses can be designed specifically to cause this kind of situation. Uh, but most of the time, I would always suspect that if your uh, laptop or your desktop keeps on crushing, uh, chances are uh, it could be a virus. Another one is missing files. So you might have encountered this in the past where you encounter pop-ups and then you, or you, when you click on a folder, it just keep on giving you a pop-up, but then the file, it would notify you that the file no longer exists and the shortcut is the one that is left. So yeah, that was quite common back then. Uh, so you may get notified uh, that it no longer exists. So it could be a cost or this could be caused by the virus deleting uh, your important files. On the other hand, it would also create new files. So uh, 
at some instance, uh, because the virus capability is replicating itself, so probably it it created multiple files, new folders. So uh, this is also another scenario wherein that particular computer is infected with uh, a virus. Problems with hardware. So viruses are known to cause system changes uh, that affect uh, external hardware and accessories. Some some viruses would actually lock you up that you cannot uh, uh, change uh, the date and time. And uh, most of the time the USB or uh, your wireless mouse cannot connect anymore at some point. This could also be cause of a virus. And computer operating by itself. I'm not sure if you have encountered this before, but at some point there are instances where it, the computer will just uh, uh, operate on its own and then uh, probably shut down its own. So at some point, the virus has already adopted probably your admin permissions and overriding everything in the system and it's it's doing on its thing. So if you have this kind of virus, it's probably a, a quite a, a rogue one, but uh, I think some of these viruses are, can already be detected by the latest antivirus software. All right. Okay, before I get into this one, let's try to look at, uh, is investing antivirus worth it? Let's try to look at this one. Uh, I'm not sure if you have tried purchasing antivirus, but I would really recommend this one. Uh, at some point, uh, if you look at that one, 1979, or let's just say 1980, and if you divide it by the 10 devices, it would only cost you around 200 pesos. And that's good for one year. But then uh, it, you have to, at least probably some of your friends, uh, you know, you agree on purchasing that particular uh, a plan and just share because this uh, antivirus can be shared uh, across different devices. So as long as the license is there, it's actually good. So I'm not promoting an antivirus software here, but at least you must have one because that's actually the first thing that I'm going to tell you uh, in terms of protecting yourself. Okay. So getting rid of computer viruses or protecting against them. So you must use a trusted antivirus product. So in this case, I believe we all know what an antivirus software is. So uh, your antivirus is the one that protects uh, yourself or your device rather from uh, these viruses. Now in terms of malware or viruses, you might be asking, uh, should we install a malware software or an, at the same time antivirus software? No. Uh, the antivirus that we have nowadays is capable already of de uh, detecting uh, different kinds of malwares. Okay, you'll just probably have to add a little bit more if you want to be protected from ransomware because ransomware has a different mechanism in terms of, yeah, uh, I think they have they have a different way of uh, implementing uh, ransomware. So different antivirus software has different approach when it comes to ransomware. Keep your software up to date. Yes, that is very true. Uh, again, as I mentioned, hopefully uh, your devices is already up to date and uh, hopefully you're using uh, the latest operating system. Although you might be saying, uh, what about those uh, devices that I have that are still working, that are still usable, but are in running Windows 7? Uh, one suggestion that I have is that there are, there are no longer updates for Windows 7. Uh, no. So all you have to do is you have to install an antivirus software there that is supporting Windows 7. I think there are still uh, antivirus software that is capable of or can be installed in a Windows uh, 7 operating system. Avoid clicking on any pop-up advertisements or suspicious links. This is one of the most common uh, things that we get too excited uh, when things appear quite appealing for us. 
So uh, without noticing, so one of the things that you have to consider is the link itself. So you have to consider looking at the link. Don't open email messages from unfamiliar senders or email attachments that you don't recognize. So as I mentioned, uh, spam emails are the ones causing a lot of issues even today. Uh, in a corporate setting, uh, a lot of employees would still open uh, email attachments that is actually intended for phishing. And that particular phishing, uh, although it's a different cybersecurity risk, uh, it pretty much uh, used as a vector, attack vector for penetrating uh, you as an individual or the corporate network. So it's, it's really risky. Another one is always scan the files that you download using file sharing programs. So every now and then, if you're downloading or you're probably downloading from your cloud, uh, cloud drives, uh, normally they have an automatic scanner, but only for smaller files, not that big files. So always consider scanning that file first before you actually use them or install them in your uh, machine. So have a dedicated uh, folder for those kind of uh, applications that you have downloaded. So some of you might have uh, a specific download folder and always make sure that the antivirus setting is probably checking on that particular folder every now and then. And that way uh, you, could, you could limit any uh, program that activates on its own. This one next is actually the UAC or the user account control. This is only applicable for Windows machines. So uh, the user account control is actually, uh, there's an equivalent for this one in Mac, but you don't have uh, much of option in there uh, compared to the one in Windows. So when changes are going to be made in your computer that requires admin level or administrator level uh, permission, UAC notifies you and gives you the chance to approve the change. So UAC can keep viruses from making unwanted changes. Now, the only problem with this one, this is actually very helpful for Windows users. But what we normally do is you are going to, if you know, if you can remember this one, the UAC has actually a, a bar that if you move it up, it becomes more strict when it comes to installing applications. But if you lower it down, it is not so strict anymore or it doesn't even request any permission if you install something. Most often than not, when you swipe it down, the chances of it is that any applications can actually, can actually download or install by itself if necessary. So you could have already avoided uh, uh, viruses that can actually install on its own that require admin level permissions. So keep it on as much as possible. Backing up your files, this one is not necessarily uh, a way of uh, protecting or getting rid of the virus, but this is one way to uh, help you uh, create, uh, this will help you create uh, what you call this, you know, uh, <laughs> probably headache, <laughs> save you from headache. But yes, of course, backing up your files is one way to protect your existing files. Okay, uh, just make sure that you back up from time to time uh, because maybe when you back up, only the backup is when you were already infected. So that I think that would be useless as well. And mind you, uh, when you have ransomware and your files are synced to the cloud and you get infected by a ransomware, those ransomware files will also encrypt those files in the cloud, so uh, you'll have to be very careful. And of course, another one is perform computer maintenance. This is some just uh, some of those things that would actually keep your machine, you know, uh, much faster over time. Like deleting the files, uh, especially in the recycle bin, uh, performing disk cleanup, uh, which actually removes temporary files generated from the browser and your operating system as well, and then perform. Uh, the fragmentation, if that particular feature is available. So for Mac users, I think you can do uh, deleting also some files 
uh, in your in your trash. All right, uh, let me see. Okay, so uh, I have a question, but let's see. Let's uh, let me try to take the answer that one. Uh, how safe is free antivirus on your working computers? Uh, to be honest with you, uh, the fact that <laughs> the antivirus is a company also selling something, uh, you can actually, uh, in some way, it's also a marketing strategy for them. They offer you free antivirus for you to be able to detect, but the other half of this of the equation is probably removing the virus. So you need another software to install. So you need to purchase the complete package in order for the virus to remove it. So those are some scenarios that, this, uh, that these companies are performing as some kind of a strategy for them. Okay, uh, YouTube videos. Uh, well, so far they are they are downloadable they are safe and the other issue there is actually the tool that you're actually using to download youtube videos so uh, if you're taking advantage of the free uh, version so that might be something that you have to rethink about again because it might be the ones that the the ones that you're that's stealing your data all right so uh I'll just have to run through one more topic for you uh, because this particular topic is really much more common to us. Okay, so and cybersecurity threats is growing on a daily basis and online exploits are just continuously happening every now and then. By the time you step on the internet, it's like you're not safe anymore. That's, that's already the scenario that we can consider, uh, we can think. Uh, nowadays okay so let's move on now if i may ask you can you identify here what possible security risks or cyber security threat that could occur from this picture anyone uh can you type in in the chat identify in this picture what areas that could lead to possible cyber security threat That's correct, unsecured Wi-Fi. What else? Free USB sticks, definitely, yes. That's very enticing actually. So free USB, free USB sticks uh, ask you to you know, grab them, but then eventually the moment that you use it, uh, I don't know what, it's, it's really see for yourself or something. There's another thing that is in this picture that is quite probably new to you. Can, can you guess that one? There's actually three. Another, another one, not the laptop. So for your information, this particular picture is actually coming from uh, I'll just take credit from Webroot here because uh, uh, Webroot has some security awareness training. And this is one of those that I actually grabbed from uh, just this picture uh, from them. So the other uh, possible cybersecurity threat here is actually this guy. Although we were not informed that these two are probably friends or something, but if you consider that this person is actually someone that is not a friend of this red, the guy at the in red. Uh, this guy is actually a possible threat. Can someone tell me what this particular, what is the term for this one today? <laughs> Spy. Okay, remember, remember our ATMs that uh, you always cover when you enter your pin. It has something like it is. It has to do uh, some. It has something to do with that one. Okay. <laughs> so, 
uh, yes, these are actually the three. The three. Okay, stalker. <laughs> Okay, a stalker is, uh, well, that's not the term used for this one, but it could also be a stalker, but there's a, now a term used for this one. This is what we call shoulder surfing. Okay, so this is becoming a risk for, for a lot of people. I'm not sure, probably one of you is guilty of this one. <laughs> Because uh, I myself, I think I have experienced or done this one. And, you know, uh, when you are probably in a bus or uh, riding or walking in a public and you suddenly stop and then someone is <laughs> typing something and you just, uh, you know, <laughs> look at what she's trying to do in her cell phone. So this is now what we call the shoulder surfing. So it's a criminal practice where thieves steal your personal data by spying over your shoulder as you use a laptop. So your ATM, public kiosk, and other electronic device in public. So despite its funny name, it's a security risk that can cause financial wipeout. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> puede, puede Maritis moves. Okay, <laughs> so thank you for your answers. So uh, yeah, moving, moving on, uh, I have another question. Uh, which are the following attack vectors that ransomware use most often to prey on users and infect computers? Uh, for this one, actually, it's quite obvious because I think I, <laughs> I forget to <laughs> move my mouse on the answer. So, yeah, the mouse is already pointing on, on <laughs> because it's just like a picture that I grabbed. So, yeah, uh, for this one, it's actually email. So, email is the most uh, popular because it's, it's one way that can actually penetrate the corporate uh, firewalls and the corporate uh, uh, virus that they have invest, uh, that they have actually implemented. So email is one way to, to uh, is the more, uh, more popular attack vectors. All right. So talking about cybersecurity threats, uh, this is the malicious act of cyber criminals or threat actors. So uh, one of those that are, these are actually happening nowadays. I believe you have read them that are causing millions of damage. So their primary purpose uh, is to damage or steal data, cause disruption, uh, denial of service, distortion or misinformation and other malicious intent. So. Uh, when we have uh, cybersecurity threats, it's always best that we are be we are informed. Uh, if you are a part of a company, uh, it's always best that there's some sort of uh, guidance among towards its employees on that one. So, <clears throat> uh, this one: uh, which of the following are the physical IT security risks of working remotely? Uh, I did not cover this in my lecture, but this is just for a general question for everyone, since most of us are working remotely. Which do you think would be your answer? Uh, we can just say A, B, C in there. There are only three choices, though. Yes. Actually, uh, it should, it's actually A. Uh, because uh, some of us might be working in cafes, Okay, internet cafes, and that's where actually risk occurs most of the time and much higher. So people are looking over your shoulder while you work or losing or damaging your devices. So uh, losing or damaging your devices and when you're working remotely, that's going to be a big problem. Another one, although I have already typed, <laughs> already provided the answer. So uh, let's just say you're in a hotel foyer connected to the public Wi-Fi, what you should bear in mind. So I think this particular question is something that you should always uh, take care uh, within yourself. Not to access, use, or share any sensitive information. So uh, I know we don't really mind uh, in, for some of us, but uh, accessing uh, sensitive information is really critical uh, over public Wi-Fi. 
uh, not to ever check boxes like save password or remember my details. Do not do this one on a public Wi-Fi. Always avoid this one. And use private browsing if possible. Okay. So uh, most of the attack scenarios for ransomware is not really happening in the Philippines, but for countries that have really quite good infrastructure are probably uh, because of companies, they have a lot of money. I've not heard so much of uh, attacks in the Philippines when it comes to uh, this kind of threat. All right, so here is another scenario where it is quite popular. So the list I have here is not uh, is not in a particular order, and I consider this one as the most popular and quite powerful cybersecurity threat: social engineering. So social engineering is a term used for uh, a broad range of malicious activities accomplished through human interactions. It, it takes advantage of uh, psychological manipulation uh, to trick users into making security mistakes or giving away sensitive information. So social engineering is actually the art of exploiting human psychology rather than technical hacking techniques. So this allows you to gain access to buildings, systems, or data. So one of the most uh, popular social engineering activity is called phishing. So in here, as an individual falls into it, uh, especially uh, when, uh, when you open an email and you don't realize that the recipient is actually, you're just being tricked. Uh, this particular email is probably pretending and pretending that it's coming from the IT or MIS uh, group that you need to update your account or something like that. So here you are without realizing because you're so busy on work, you just click on it, enter the information and bam, your personal information is now captured. So another one is called spare uh, phishing. So spare phishing is actually quite more of a targeted or personalized phishing attack by impersonating someone the target knows and, and trusts. So uh, I'm pretty sure this phishing is actually, I'm not sure if you're a victim, but I'll give you, I'll show an example here of an actual case uh, in the next slides. And then another one is whaling, uh, a phishing attempt to target a large scale or high ranking uh, executives. So in order for these uh, people to gain access to sensitive data or money. The next one is actually a case uh, of spare uh, phishing. So this one is, the platform is Facebook. I hope not some of you are not a victim here. So a 70 year old male, uh, retired government employee, sent 5,000 to a person supposedly connected to a priest who was about to be ordained. Someone was acting in behalf of the priest who was about to be ordained, asking donations for his ordination. It is a, just a very simple trick, okay? So what happened basically is that uh, the priest is actually a friend of the victim, okay? Uh, for your information, this 70 year old is actually someone I know. So I cannot get the actual script or the text messages that they have in Facebook, but uh, he's someone that I know personally. So the strategy here is acting as a middleman and use the priest as a way of attracting donors or donations for the upcoming celebration. Target friends of that priest, okay? So it's just a very simple strategy. So if you know, so if you know probably this priest, you would also be willing to donate. But the problem is you did not verify who the person asking for that particular donation. So in that case, you have to be very much aware on who that particular person is. Another one, uh, platform, Lazada. The store is a Mora bike shop. I'm not sure if this particular bike shop still exists in, in Lazada. The strategy, uh, selling expensive uh, MTB or road bikes at a very affordable price, 50% down payment, 50% upon receiving of the item, ask you to chat privately for a faster transaction. Now, the problem with this one is that 
in Lazada, when Lazada was actually post or in their store, they're actually posting the picture and then the price, right? But then you cannot add it to cart. They are going to ask you to communicate through them through chat. So what happens? Uh, the target uh, various buyers interested in cheap bikes. Okay. So the number one thing that you also have to consider when these things occur is that always make sure that you're familiar with, uh, remember when you sign up for Lazada or Shopee, you have that agreement that you just click and proceed to next. Everything is actually in there in order for you to be protected. Now, for, for example, this one is in Lazada. Do not accept payment instructions through chat or email. So never accept payments from sellers through messages or chat in the Lazada app. All payment instructions will be provided by Lazada once you request it and so on and so on. So in this case, what happens is after that one, after the chat, it lures the, the buyer to transfer to a different platform. So new full cash and delivery. Okay. So yeah, that's okay. So they have agreed. And then at some point, uh, I think there is some point here where in the, uh, they transferred to, uh, Viber. Viber as a way of communicating to make things much faster. So this time you're already outside of the Lazada platform. Now, one of the things that you have to know is that once you complain to Lazada, you will not be entertained because you are not using the platform to conduct the transaction. That's the very first problem that you have to, uh, that, that's going to be the very first problem that you're going to encounter. So I'm not going to hide that name in there because <laughs> this has actually been reported already. So this is actually a friend of mine. So... Uh, he didn't pursue this particular, what do you call this, for this particular transaction because he realized that after paying this 3000 amount here, the seller asked for another 2K for the shipping fee, which was not actually at the very first part of the agreement. So that actually makes it suspicious already. So this is a quite, uh, this is something that is really fishy. So you have to be very careful. Uh, from time to time. All right. So those are some of the actual cases that I can consider in, in terms of cybersecurity. All right. Now, <clears throat> uh, moving forward, uh, another question for everyone. Uh, this might be very familiar to everyone as well. What characteristics do strong passwords have? Eight or more characters, upper and lower case letters, numbers. Okay, yes, probably, obviously, all of the above. But I hope, but I hope you are doing that one, okay? So I hope your, your passwords is that complicated because it's really difficult to remember, actually. But here's actually a, a, a good example later on. Okay, so among all these things, uh, including the computer virus, uh, the cybersecurity threats, uh, the weakest link in security is actually the human element. Uh, this guy, Kevin Mitnick, is a cybersecurity professional. Uh, you can search him on YouTube and there's some a lot of cyber uh, <laughs> cybersecurity videos that he created that you will really be amazed in terms of how, how dangerous the internet is nowadays. So 90% or 95% of all successful cyber attacks is caused by human error, according to the IBM Cybersecurity Intelligence Index. So it's very important that uh, we are fully aware most of the time. What they're trying to point out here is the cognitive, uh, yeah, uh, the cognitive, uh, what they call this, uh, efficiency. So technology became a habit for us rather than a conscious act. So if you talk about cognitive efficiency, it is the brain's ability to process information and it covers both short-term and long-term memory. 
So short term memory speed, uh, short term memory and processing speed. So in other words, your cognitive efficiency describes the abilities to think at a high rate, high rate of speed and quickly retrieve recent memories. So with uh, this particular uh, scenario gives us uh, or considered us as the weakest link in the cyber security in the security in the security uh, chain. So let's try to watch a short video clip here. As long as that's the case, we're vulnerable. So today we sent a camera out on the Hollywood Boulevard to help people by asking them to tell us their password. And <laughs> this is how that went. We're talking about cybersecurity today and how safe people's passwords are. What is one of your online passwords currently? It is my dog's name and the year I graduated from high school. Oh, what kind of dog do you have? I have a Chihuahua Papillon. And what's its name? Jameson. Jameson. And where did you go to school? Um, I went to school back in Greensburg, Pennsylvania. What school? Uh, Hempfield Area Senior High School. Oh, when did you graduate? In 2009. Oh, great. <laughs> it's like my cat's name and then just like a random number. Okay. Has you had this cat for a while? Yeah, she's my childhood pet. Aw. And what's her name? Her name is Jolie. Jolie. Mm -hmm. So like a password of yours would be Jolie and then a number. Yeah. Like number one? Uh, like my birthday. Oh, when is your birthday? Uh, June 12th. Oh, nice. And what year were you born? Uh, 95. Oh, great. Mm -hmm. So Jolie, 6, 12, oh, 95. Yes. Got it. So you mean to give my password right now? No, I cannot do that. But we all want to know what it is so we can tell you if it's strong or not. Oh, my goodness. Um... Um, let me think. Okay, one is Tel Aviv. Yeah, four, six, eight, and then Israel. It's it's only three, but it's you know it's uh, for me it's strong enough. Ireland, one, two, three, four. Gemma, one, two, three. Spell G E M M A. Well, most of them are Italian. Oh, beautiful. Yeah, like, so like... Like, what's a good Italian password? Uh, my grandma's name. What's your uh, grandma's name? Uh, Maria. Maria. So, Maria is your password? Oh, yeah, now you know my password. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, the important thing is they learned a um, terrible lesson. Okay, so that's 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 just uh, uh, an example uh, where basically most of us would fall, fall, fall for it. So that is really something that we should, we should always be aware all of the time. So they're probably, I'm not sure for any one of us, you'll probably be enticed to tell all your password because you're on televised, uh, you're recorded. So that is just really sad. <laughs> that is just really sad. All right. So uh, again, uh, password, protecting yourself. Uh, as you all know, password is the most, or we'll just say, the more popular security feature that we use today. So password complexity is a consideration that you have to look into. So a good secure password should be at least be eight or more characters, a combination of upper and lower case letters, numbers, and symbols. So just like this one, probably. So what's cooler than one dinosaur? Hashtag two dinosaurs. So, <clears throat> sorry. So you have WCT one D uh, question mark hashtag two D. So th the problem with this one is that memorizing these things is just quite hard. So you might have to consider uh, 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 what Gerard mentioned in that chat there. Combination of those words. So. Uh, yeah, that might be something that would be useful. Just add some hash, some symbols and numbers. Okay, next one. This is actually one of the things that uh, the cybersecurity firm where I uh, act as a consultant. Uh, so there's always a security awareness. So the security awareness training is being done on a monthly basis because the employees are focused mostly on their work. They, they tend to forget the, uh, that when they receive email, they may not even realize that they just open it because they're always on the computer. So 
having a security training or our security awareness training allows you to be involved and aware of the common techniques to identify possible fraud sites or knowing if the site is secure or not. So this must be uh, uh, this must be a must actually, especially for uh, even for us schools. Okay, for our schools, considering that we have a lot of personal information from our students, uh, also for hospitals. Okay, so especially also that most of our devices are connected already to the internet. Another one is, I have mentioned this earlier, uh, antivirus program. Uh, on a personal level, I think antivirus program is our first defense. Now on a corporate level, they normally term this one as endpoint protection. Endpoint protection is actually a combination of different tools that allows the the company to protect all, all their devices, uh, servers, and other uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, electronic devices that they're using within the company. So it is something that uh, covers probably uh, a firewall at the same time, uh, antivirus, and even uh, security software that allows them to, before they can use their device, there's actually uh, an authentication that, that will be done. The next one is protecting yourself. I'm not sure if many of you are familiar with this one, but this is actually very popular. And, and I think Google said here that F MFA or 2FA is implemented around half of the threats are actually gone. So just imagine that one. So 50% of the threats or yeah, are actually removed. So if you implemented two, uh, two FA or MFA, uh, although for some, it, this might be annoying actually, uh, let's say you want to access your email. Uh, I think most of our emails or popular applications are already implementing two FA. So I think including Facebook, so your emails. So every time you access your emails, you have to consider uh, looking at uh, what do you call this? You have to consider uh, responding through your phone, right? So uh, it is actually uh, considered as one of those things that uh, considered as secure because it goes through your phone for approval. And that is something that is quite, quite good actually. Although what happened to BDO, <laughs> uh, the OTP issue that was bypassed, uh, I think that was a quite a sophisticated sophisticated hack, and those that were captured actually are just like pawns. Uh, the people behind the real people behind the hack are not actually there, so uh, there's still something wrong with their. their uh, I'm not sure. I cannot confirm, but as they admitted, uh, there was an old system that they have, but uh, that's too bad actually. Uh, they 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 missed that one for. They miss the part where they have to update, feed up, uh, update uh, uh, their software. So that's what happens if you miss uh, some of those common things that you need to do in order to protect yourself. Okay, um, let me take that question. Is it safe to use suggested password when you sign in? Suggested password are actually quite complicated, uh, especially for, yeah. Suggested password are more complex. So it's really up to you if you want to take it, but then remembering it is another problem that is true. I will agree to that one. So at some point, uh, if you really want to follow those suggested password, especially for Mac, Mac has quite really difficult suggested passwords it's really difficult for you to remember. I can't even memorize it because it's just too complex. So I have to write it down. But then that's another issue. Writing it down is another problem. So <clears throat> uh, is it safe to save passwords in our mobile phones? Uh, one thing, by the way, uh, do not store your passwords in the browser. Okay, I have witnessed this myself there's a tool that can actually read passwords that are stored in the browser. And this is coming from different browsers. 
may it be Edge, Chrome, Firefox, or Safari. So there's a tool. I have tried it myself and they can really read the passwords. It's actually created. I'm not sure how they stored it, but uh, I was able to try it myself. So saving passwords in your mobile phones. Uh, okay. Uh, if you plan to save your passwords, uh, I'm not sure if you're open to this idea, but the way I store my passwords is that uh, I don't store it in a complete, <clears throat> you know, if this is actually 10 characters or eight, try to see if you can come up with something like, uh, if you can remember by having, let's say you just uh, store your password in notes, probably in, in your cell phone, and then you probably type the first letter and then probably the last letter or number or the last character and then just dot 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 <clears throat> because i really have a lot of accounts and there's no way i can remember different passwords all the time so i came up with an idea that uh, i'll just store it somewhere but then i do not store the full password okay so if the password is uh, uh kawali electric pan so one, two, three. So I just store K dot, 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 three in the end. So something like that. <clears throat> and yeah, it's, it's, it, it helped me actually. So fingerprints are used to say, actually fingerprints are quite, uh, I don't think they can be, although they can be captured, but it's a little bit sophisticated now. So I don't think, uh, passwords are more prone for, for to be stolen good but fingerprints i don't think so now duo uh, this is actually a, a tool that that is used for uh for organizations before they can actually log into their computers so let's say you have a password in your laptop before you log in what duo does is that it performs a uh, uh, a two-factor uh, authentication by sending a notification to your email through a Duo app. And from there, you're going to confirm. And once you confirm it, that's the only time that the laptop, it will continue to load. So the operating, the, you can see the desktop. So it's another tool that some organizations are actually implementing. Although uh, investing in cybersecurity is actually, is really expensive. But nevertheless, at least knowing those personal things that are that I have shared today, uh, hopefully you can also protect yourself at, at the very least. All right. So, yeah, I think that's the end. I'll just have some key takeaways here. So the importance of IT security and the potential consequences of lapses. Yes, IT security, hopefully your company would be able to invest on this one because uh, who knows, uh, there might be a lot of people already in the Philippines trying to take advantage of what is uh, replicating what is happening in other countries. Know what sort of IT security hazards to look out for, both physical and digital, and a few of the ways you can protect yourself and your company. Importance of backing up and best practice as well as to craft a solid password. Best practice for working remotely or telecommunicating telecommuting and safely work on your laptops and mobile phones in public areas and connect to public hotspots. So I, I did not elaborate on this one though, because uh, I couldn't cover, uh, yeah, uh, I was not able to cover everything that uh, <clears throat> uh, I have to share to you today, uh, but hopefully, uh, yeah, in terms of public hotspots, try to avoid, uh, yeah, as much as possible, use VPN if you're trying to purchase or do banking transactions if you're in a public hotspot. And then be aware of shoulder surfers. So either way, the better informed you are, the easier it will be for you to stay safe. So if your organization has an IT department, make sure to stay on top of any updates to software or, uh, or whatever, whatever policy that they make available. Okay, uh, let me take on questions. Uh, using one specific password, so 
uh, sorry, sir, it is not a good idea. Yes, I know uh, many of us are using passwords uh, for Facebook, same password for email, same password for among other things. It's just not recommended. Uh, that's why I mentioned to myself that I have a lot of accounts, different passwords. Problem is memorizing them. So I just came up with that strategy that, well, I will just have to store this somewhere. And if it's going to be stolen, then it's up to the hacker to identify what are those uh, missing letters or characters in the data. <laughs> yes, it is difficult. Security is actually quite complicated. Uh, what is the best antivirus software? Uh, I cannot say for the least, but you can look at the recommended. There are actually annual uh, recommendations of antivirus software, but for my personal use, I actually have Bitdefender. So I also even install antivirus for my Mac. Uh, yes. All right, any other questions? Thank you for your questions. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, as much as possible, if you're in a public Wi-Fi, uh, probably if you're in an internet cafe, try to do incognito tab uh, as much as you can. It's actually better compared to the using the regular browser. <clears throat> uh, most of the popular antiviruses nowadays can have a version for Mac. And yes, for my Mac, I also use uh, Bitdefender. Of course, uh, Apple would say that uh, they don't require uh, antivirus, but <clears throat> for me, I just want to be. <laughs> anyway, when you purchase, uh, uh, let's say, Bitdefender, uh, let's say the license, you can install it on different devices as well. So you have... Uh, let's say you have a Windows, you have a mobile, you can have a Mac, so you can use it across different operating systems. Uh, from Sarah, if you the one I have showed earlier, actually, the pricing of that is actually based on Bitdefender. How about remember password, sir? Yeah, uh, as much as possible, that remember password. Yes, that particular feature that you have stored in the browser, remember password, uh, there's actually a tool that can read. Yes, there's actually a tool. <clears throat> uh, you can look at this. Uh, I think you can look at it this way. If you are going to store passwords, just try to consider if, is there any particular sensitive information for, for that particular site or account? Uh, try to imagine yourself being uh, on a hot seat or being, you know, uh, on a scandal scenario. So there might be, are there really sensitive information that would cause my life to be, you know, that would depress me if that particular uh, account is going to be hacked. So you can look at it this way if you if you want to if you want to utilize. Uh, remember a password feature in browsers. Because as for me, I would not recommend it. Although you might be asking also, uh, what about password managers? Okay, so you might be familiar with LastPass, 1Password. Uh, yeah, there are actually a lot of password managers that are being utilized. Uh, on a corporate level, uh, it's actually useful. Um, there's also, <clears throat> for me, I'm still, I still have some hesitation actually for password managers, but they actually have a feature that actually enticed me to use it. So LastPass is the one I'm using, uh, but it's actually something that is part of uh, the organization that I'm connected with. So I didn't purchase that one. All right, any other questions? Uh, Gerard, <laughs> that's outside of the topic already. 
but I can answer that question. Okay, for anything that you go, okay, uh, for any transactions that, or let's just, let me just take it this way. For anything that you do that involves purchasing or banking transactions, always make sure that the URL has an HTTPS because the S starts for secure. Actually, most of the websites are already HTTPS. Only a very few uh, left. Or left. <laughs> yeah, if you do Lazada, you, you do Shopee, make sure your URL has HTTPS. Yes, you're, well, you're welcome. Thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate your questions, your participation as well. And yeah, uh, there's still a lot of things to learn actually in cybersecurity, but uh, the time consideration also, we don't want to be overwhelmed as well. So yeah, I hope that's it enough for today. Yes, thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Thank you, Sir Larry. That was very interesting. I also learned a lot. I hope everyone were able to get that. So then shall we proceed to the next portion in the webinar? Um, by the way, if you have questions, please feel free to unmute your microphone or use the raise hand reactions or please type it in the chat box if you have uh, additional or follow-up question. Uh, if you do not have any question, allow me to proceed to the next slide. Next slide, please. <clears throat> allow me to read the citation. Uh, Siliman University, Dr. Mariana Lau, ICI Free Computer Education Program, uh, certificate of the guest, uh, certificate of recognition presented to uh, Assistant Professor Laurie Vincent Rehensha for sharing his valuable knowledge as resource speaker during the Dr. Mariana Lau ICI Free Computer Education with the topic Understanding Computer Viruses. Given this fifth day of March in the year of our Lord 2022, signed by our very own project leader and sole director, Dr. Dave E. Marshall. Thank you so much. Uh, there you go. Okay, so at this juncture, our uh, next slide, please. Okay. There you go. Okay, so at this juncture, our team here will be sending you the link in the chat box for you to have and fill out the evaluation form for today's training. So for you to have the certificate, feel free to fill out the evaluation form. The link, it's there in the chat box. Click that one. And then next slide, please. Uh, I also would love to invite everybody for the upcoming webinar scheduled at SU Dr. Mariana Lau Free Computer Education Program every Saturday at exactly 2 p.m. So our complete list of our topic will be posted. It's also there down below. It will be posted at our Facebook page at Dr. Mariana Lau Free Computer Education. Okay, next slide, please. At this moment, I'd like to ask everybody to open their camera for the photo opportunity together with our resource speaker.
Let's wait for the others to turn on their camera. Okay, let us show our best smile. In count of one, two, three, smile. Next slide, uh, hold your smile. One, two, three, smile. Okay, thank you so much for attending our session this afternoon. Uh, once again, thank you for joining and see you on next Saturday. God bless us all. Thank you, Pa.